there's some problem at the moment with my PC. Okay. Right. Um, so if you've got any questions, please ask in the chat. And if there is any issue with the uh, internet connectivity, um, please try to be uh, try to stay online. And I will also, if I have any problem, I will come back and um, come back and join again. Right. So basically, uh, to introduce you to the design process, and there is a thing called design optimization, and um, we'll go through the case study, uh, meshing, um, contact mechanics. Um, that's where some of the case studies are there. Enhances. We'll go through that. Um, structural vibration. I got a case study. Unfortunately, it's not opening at the moment. Um, we'll try our best. Um, to open that. Um, so, yeah, we'll try our best. So then the summary. So that's it. So I think some of you might have listened to my first like um, session about the uh, future um, scope of um, computational mechanics. I mean, the computer aided engineering in industry. So we have gone through the um, types of analysis there. So basically it's a structural analysis covers the, that part where you got the linear static, non-linear static, static means the loading condition actually. Then you got non-linear static means that, I think that's the majority of the industrial applications um, need that because machines work um, in um, non-idealistic situation where the loading condition could be um, dynamic as well. And the um, behavior of the um, situation, I mean, non-linearities could appear in the material. So that could be plasticity, hyperelasticity, um, temperature uh, driven stress or creep, or um, large, very large deflection uh, we call uh, some um, the stress stiffening activity as well. So this is the area of actually the machine design part, structural analysis of course. There are thermal, thermal mechanical analysis and fatigue. Um, these are uh, considered different. So the, the CFD is the part where we do system level of um, analysis, okay? So structure, the CFD could be an input to the structural analysis, right? We, we, we are not discussing CFD today. Um, the car crashworthiness, impact simulation, drop test simulation, occupant safety, all are considered as the analysis required for um, certification, okay? So that means there are regulatory bodies and we need to meet um, some criteria in order to manufacture the product or the design the product into uh, and make it into the market. Okay, so that's why we need to do that. So these are obligatory things, uh, noise, um, vibration, harshness as well. Um, again, as a subcategory of the dynamic analysis, you can see rotodynamics, multi-body, bird strike, et cetera. Um, so just to highlight the design process. So it's basically starts from a problem. So that's called problem identification. Then it goes into an ideation stage where you have to do some concept work. And uh, from that, the design process actually starts with some drawing, drafting, mechanism, design, etc. in CAD. Then it goes into refinement and then the analysis. Um, which takes place, that's where the, the computational side of things happen, mainly. Though we have things to do in the concept stage as well, which I'm going to talk in a minute. Now, um, from there, the refinement starts. So the analysis feedback back into the design process, and then it refines, that design refines, and then that gets into the, the design selection process. And then the implementation phase is where the further advanced computational mechanical analysis will take place for certification requirements. And then we document it. So that's the um, standard design practice we follow in industry, right? So the, the analysis or the computational um, mechanic side of things will happen, uh, will take place in the detailed design phase from the refinement to the documentation. 
okay? So let's look into some sort of uh, a case study here. So th th this is a bike manufacturer who wanted to update the version of the existing product, okay? So there was some uh, customer feedback and they had some issues with the, um, with the suspension system. So there is a version two, they had to update that. So, so the initial, I mean, it's the designer's job to come back with 3D models, et cetera, and draw some drafting, et cetera. However, uh, whoever designs that, taking part in that design, it could be an analyst or could be the design engineer itself, come back with some sort of um, minor level of analysis. So these are kinematic simulations, basically to understand the motion and, and the kinematic parameters within that. So um, sometimes we call this as um, analysis for design space to understand what sort of leverage or what sort of uh, space we have, uh, uh, we, we, what sort of space is available to play with the design. Okay, so that's, that's what it is basically. So then the engineering charts, we look at the engineering charts and get some parameters so for optimization basically. And that goes into uh, a further detailed analysis on the suspension, you can see there. And uh, that then the, the finite element take place, finite element analysis take place on the uh, proposed designs. And with that engineering parameters, we do the analysis and uh, a prototype is made, okay? So this is what is how an engineering problem looks like uh, in broader terms, okay? So that actually is an inevitable part of the design process. So, um, to put in in time so in terms of timeline okay so you have a problem and uh, somebody will write a requirement for that problem right what needs to be solved and then you have um, to understand the system level of that design okay so it could be cfd it could be uh, cooling um, so 1d system simulations with um, software like simulink or it's basically simulation uh, to understand the system level of the design, okay? So that then inputs into a component level, right? So for example, the CFD gives you the temperature and the temperature will go into the structure analysis to get the uh, temperature induced stresses, okay? Creep, etc. So vibration, fatigue, lifing, etc. are under the component level. So I'm, I'm talking only about the computational side of the design process, okay? Of course, there is parallelly, you got the draft design, concept design, draft design, then detailed design and uh, validation, then manufacturing, design for manufacturing, and then um, um, the certification of the design. So that goes parallelly with the computational um, activities, okay? So certification requirement is where you have designed something and you have done a prototype and uh, that's, that works and you want to produce that mass, um, so you, you, you want to uh, do a mass production, okay? So you want to get that product into the market. So that's where you need to certify that. So for, ex for example, for aerospace, it, it's, uh, it's airworthiness standard, okay? So uh, for automotive, it's um, there could be another standard for automotive worthiness. So you have you have to prove that. So in the um, automotive and aerospace, you, there is something called crash test or impact test. So that's where um, you you are testing all the design parameters and then take that uh, input back into the structure analysis or the system level design, and then you refine. If that fails, if the certification fails, you have to refine the design or those data can be used to upgrade the design or to refine the design later stages, okay? So these are all government obligatory kind of thing for crash tests, safety tests, et cetera. Now, um, after the product gets into the market, uh, you will come across uh, some service issues or non-conformances. So it's primarily like um, primarily 
and driven from the um, issues related with the lifing, or it could be like uh, uh, the, the manufacturer promises a life or a number of cycles to the product, but the, at the service end, the user, the end user or the customer may not be happy with the lifing. It may fail before that uh, promised life. So it's a, gra- gra- um, it's a warranty issue then it comes back to the design table and the, you, you may need to Excuse look at me. the design Excuse me, hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, have you shared the screen? Slides are not seen. It's, oh, it's very unfortunate. I have shared the screen. Okay, because we are not getting it. Thank you, you want. So, uh, so, sorry about that, I thought it was yeah, I, I can see that I am sharing the screen. Has anyone, anybody else got the problem then? Yeah, but you will, no one is getting, I think, there are, um, there are problems. Okay. Um, shall I um, stop the share and then I will share again? Yeah, okay. okay. Yes. yes. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah. Now it is. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. I think I think I will go through that once again. Um, okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Cheers. Right. Um, we have missed a lot, I believe. Um, right. I think. This one I have um, shown last time. So it's basically structural analysis going through that bit, right? So that's basically the machine design part of things. Nonlinear means that. So plasticity, hyperelasticity, creep, et cetera. Um, thermal analysis, you can see the conduction, convection, and radiation, et cetera, over there. And then I have said about the crashworthiness, the um, uh, the certification requirements, we need to meet something that's that's taken care of by the crash analysis. Uh, NVH, et cetera, um, again, that's part of the um, regulatory thing, okay? So that's the uh, thing I have shared. So then the design process itself, you can see from the refinement to the documentation, that's the main um, part of um, that, that that's the area, that's the stages where um, the computational applications needed or required, okay? So the CAD uh, models will be generated from there onwards, actually. So that's what I said with that case study, for example, the bike and suspension uh, design, so redesigning the suspension, actually. So it comes with uh, initial ideation would be with some kinematics uh, understanding and then some looking at the, um, the, the, the specifications or the parameters uh, of the suspension um, with some plots, et cetera. And then you go into design, looking into the structural design of the suspension and using these parameters, you actually come up with finite elements, um, results, and that would go back into the design and then you develop a prototype, right? So that's why I said regarding the uh, process, as you can see, somebody would start uh, writing the requirements document or the problem. Then it goes into the system stage where uh, you look at the problem at a system level. So uh, it could be kinematics, it could be CFD cooling or 1D system optimization. Then it goes back into the feeds, back into the component level. You can see the structural analysis, vibration, fatigue, lifing, et cetera. So this is where actual design takes place, right? Then it goes into, once you make that um, design, then you have to do some experiments or so prototype testings happens. And then the that will take back into the certification stage. So that's where, so there are some leg- regulatory um, um, requirements you need to meet. Uh, and so, for example, airworthiness is for aerospace and crashworthiness is for automotive. So all this will be part of that to prove the safety um, of the product. 
Then uh, the service issue, as, as I said, when the product gets into the market, there could be issues. And then you go back into the design stage again to look at what issues causing it, so to improve it. So fracture mechanics is one of them. Um, we look into that and see whether uh, it can guarantee the life promised to the customer, okay? So um, sometimes it could be that you cannot meet the life uh, initially predicted by the um, computational systems. Then you may need something else. You may need to look at the experiment and validate, uh, look at the validation process to see whether the methods are going in line with the experiments or like that. And then you need to improve the methodology of the computational system to uh, get a good product into the market. So that was my point. So I hope uh, from there on, um, I haven't talked before. Yeah, okay. So, so my point is simulation driven product design. So that, what is that? It's, it's all about, um, reducing the product life cycle. Product life cycle means starting from the um, concepts phase or requirements understanding from the customer to the end product when it is, it is actually um, going out of the um, shop floor after producing. So that's the product life cycle. So in that you can see the, the various stages like simulation, virtual prototype, design analysis, parametric design optimization, right? So these computational methods actually um, taking place all these process. So this is basically called simulation driven uh, product development. The idea is time to market is crucial. So lead time to be reduced um, and the quality and um, the development cost. So these are the three things you need to optimize through the simulation driven. So computational simulation, so computational mechanics um, and the computational methods all are uh, vital these days for product life cycle uh, management uh, for getting the product into the market. The, the main reason is the competition, uh, the pricing, the cost structure, etc. So it's all vital to get the product out of the, uh, to get into the market. So that's why you, you, you can see these days, you can see an upgraded version of an iPhone every um, six months or every year. Same like the cars, car industry, you can see the cars are upgrading uh, in a, in frequently. So this is because to, to keep up to date with the market, all right, catch the customer. So that's why um, simulation driven product design is important. So what is simulation driven um, product design? So it's not only totally the finite element of CFD, it's also, you can see the manufacturing simulations, right? So this is where you apply the computational practices into the manufacturing process. And then uh, I don't know whether you have heard of Monte Carlo simulation. So Monte Carlo simulation uh, is basically looking at the variations in, in things. So that's uh, very useful in manufacturing simulation these days. So design for manufacture, design for service, et cetera, uses uh, Monte Carlo simulation these days. Now, um, 2D drawing, that's part of the CAD, design for manufacturing, as I said before, design for assembly. So this is part of the variational analysis, which we are not going to discuss today. So variation analysis, what it does is um, you have a function um, where you look at the variation within the design, it could be the stresses, it could be um, the assembly th parameters, or it could be the tolerance or the manufacturing um, variation within the manufacturing, within the design. So all are simulated these days to get that uh, product life cycle to be shortened, okay? And then documentation. So that's simulation driven product design. So coming back to the machine design, for the mechanical engineers, what is important? First of all, at the concept stage, you have a design optimization, right? So not all the companies um, do that these days, but uh, certainly this is part of the modern practice, okay? So what design optimization is, that sits within the computational methods, right? So this is basically um, looking at the geometrical parameters 
uh, looking at the shape of the geometries and optimize it. So uh, imagine if you, these days, if you order something from Amazon or something from, um, from um, a top um, a company or something like that, a top supplier, right? You may get, and traditionally you used to have um, things like um, brackets or structures where you got a big chunk of metal, right? I mean, um, if you look at the old lorries, I think back in my school days, um, the lorries um, had uh, like the bulldozers, for example, these had a b very big chunk of uh, metal inside, right? So that was the traditional design because that was uh, not optimized version of designs that was just to check the strength. So in order to put strength, they had to put lots of material in. Material is costlier. optimize this. So that's why design optimization comes in, right? So it looks at the parameters there and then optimize uh, the parameters we choose and get a, a, an ideal shape, uh, to, but it will meet all the criteria as well. For example, the strength uh, and it optimizes the weight. For example, in that example, it's like that. So twice stiffness of new design compared to the old design for equal mass. That's what it optimized with different kind of iterations. And as part of the design process, the designer um, or the structural engineer selects one of that best design, okay, given by the computational method. So um, uh, in the computational terms, it's called topology optimization. So you got the um, shape, size, weight, volume, stiffness, stress, all these parameters, right? Um, taken into the NFE A analysis, finite element analysis, and then you try to minimize it, right? So basically that's the mathematical terms, uh, uh, expressed in mathematical terms. So you got a function there that's raw. So the raw could be any of them. And then you try to uh, minimize that function. So this um, you, of row could be uh, uh, another uh, function which depends to the main um, um, optimizing function. So then we call it objective function, right? So then we try to um, formulate that, right? So in, in, in mathematical terms and then with matrices as um, in the, like the K is equal to stiff, sorry, the force is equal to stiffness into displacement formula. And we use that uh, to do the FEA analysis, right? So it's essential part of the simulation driven product design. And there is significant reduction of cost from that and load of advantages comparing to the traditional design as, you, as, as the example I have said about the lorries. Um, so one of the, the main reasons these days we do is to optimize the weight because weight is a significant factor, especially in the aerospace industry where things are flying and you need to try to reduce the weight as much as possible. So these days, if you look at structures, you can see it's like that rather than like that. Okay, that was the traditional way of doing things like mounting brackets, structures like that. These days we do like that because that's a weight optimized design. Okay, so it starts with the CAD assembly, create the fine determine, then optimization model. First iteration gives you something and then you try to optimize that again and again to get a shape optimized version. Um, right, so this is another example, right? So it's basically right first time um, starting with an optimized concept. So these pockets of a, uh, so initially it was a big chunk of metal and uh, the, the finite element package gives you the optimized shape and then you further optimize it. So it's lighter, but um, stronger. So that reduces the analysis cycles as well. So product durability is preserved there. So again there, I mean, I got, uh, yeah, so the, I mean, these days, if you look at the structures like that, this is a mounting structure for the camera. 
you may come across something like that rather than a big chunk of metal there. So that's how we optimize using the topology optimization, right? Um, this is an important um, cost saving exercise you do in industry. Okay, so as I said before, the computational process starts with a uh, preprocessor, right? So where you input the CAD geometry data, engineering data, uh, product knowledge and experience, and that gives a, 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 a result of uh, input text file. Then you have solver, which does the uh, numerical simulation, and you get the uh, answer of that numerical simulation, and then there is a post processor which takes that uh, input and then gives you nice colorful plots. So that's how the process works, okay? So uh, that part is important from pre-processing the post-processing. So that part is important. Now, um, as I said before about the uh, engineering machine design, it's not only really new product development, okay? So um, there is other area called problem solving. So I got a case study here. So it depends on how well I can open the ANSYS window for you. Um, give me a moment. Right. Um, Okay, I'm trying to open that um, file. Okay, so what is shown there is a Francis turbine, water turbine, hydraulic turbine, okay? So um, the, there was a big problem um, with the design of that system, okay? So that was designed product and that was installed in Canada. And um, what happened was there was a problem. So the, there is a control mechanism. So that what that control mechanism does is it adjusts the veins there. You can see the veins where the water gets in, okay? And uh, if there is an excessive torque or if there is a, a problem with jamming between these um, veins, um, there is a thing called cascade failure. So that's where, for example, you've got a foreign ob object, for example, a driftwood get into there and that can block uh, the entire system. So it can, so because if one drift, drift wood gets in, then entire veins can jam together and that impart a big torque onto the control mechanism and the system can fail, okay? So in order to avoid that phenomena, what um, in the design, there is somewhere there is a safety um, device, a shear pin, which is attached within that system, okay, what Chapin does is when there is an excessive stress or excessive torque coming into that system, that Chapin breaks and then uh, the entire thing the, the, um, will detach from the, the jam occurred, uh, the, the place where the jam occurred, okay. But what happened in Canada was um, the Chapin didn't break, right? So, um, the shear pin was designed based on the uh, knowledge about the, uh, the loading acting on it. So in that system, there was a few friction plates. So this is the shear pin you can see over there and the friction plates. So this is basically, you don't want, when it breaks, you don't want excessive vibration going into that system. So you need to give some damping, okay? You need to um, give some friction so that the the once it detaches, it will stop um, immediately without um, vibrating or anything like that. So that's why we put friction. So what happened was um, the shear pin didn't break in Canada. So um, so because of that, the entire system got jammed, and all this unit came out. So um, two fifty million dollar lost because of that um, silly shaping, okay? So this is how you get problems as a computational uh, 
uh, engineer, as a um, person who knows computational mechanics, either in academics uh, doing the programming and numerical simulations, or an industrial person who is playing with um, software like um, analysis software. Okay, so both for the both population, this is a problem to solve. So my point is, you will get realistic problem like that. Right. So the question is why the shear bin didn't break and what we, how we need to redesign that. That could be the question. So this is a top view. So this is the control system, which actually controls the, um, the veins there. OK, so um, let me show you the ANSYS files there. Um, so this is the challenge faced by the person who knows computational mechanics or computer aided engineering, right? So it's not that you cannot model all the realistic parameters into a, a numerical process, okay? That's not possible. So it's, a, uh, it's up to the, the person who actually looks at the problem, needs to break down, right? So CA is all about solving real engineering problem by an accepted methodology. So you need to do the problem um, and then you need to get the results and compare the, this with some approved methodology. So we call it validation, right? So once you solve that computationally, then you need to validate that. But breaking down the big realistic problem is an issue, okay? So I will wait until the answer is open so we can move on to the next slide. Um, so key things here is like uh, nonlinear elements there because friction is there. Friction is nonlinear when you put friction coefficient, etc. And there is uh, material nonlinearity there. Shear pin, um, if it is not failing, then it's getting into the plastic uh, deformation, isn't it? If it is not breaking. Um, so these things needs to be um, considered when you do uh, a simulation or when you do a numerical investigation. Okay, um, the picture shows the, the results actually, um, right? Um, yeah, it's slowly opening. Um, give me a moment. So my point is, if you want to remodel that, uh, if you want to model that system, um, you need to think, you need to assume certain things. You need to think, uh, you need to think about the boundary condition. As well as you need to think about the, uh, the system behaviors in, in terms of linear and nonlinear. However, for the industrial practice, we need to simplify as much as possible uh, for the problem. So um, before I start, I, I talked about the verification and validation. So the method we follow should be um, a verified and valid, uh, it should be a validated method. So this is a chart of the ASME actually. So if you start with a real structure, um, you have to model it. So it goes through these two loops. So one is analysis. So you create the structural model with the geometry equations, materials. So it doesn't matter if you do that by software or if you do that by, um, if you do that by, um, numerical programming, okay? The numerical methods and programming. So you create a computational uh, model and then you, you have a code verification. That's where you, you, you need to look at the numerical methods for its uh, robustness. And then the calculation verification, you do some hand calculation and then you compare that with the simulation results. But uh, the validation is also going through that pathway and both needs to be matching. And that is an acceptable agreement. So that proves that the, the solution you have done is accurate. And that actually points to the uh, right direction in, in terms of solving the problem, okay? So in terms of the industrial um, practice, so that's important, validate the method, whatever um, the method you adopt in terms of validating that. So it's it's interesting. It was an interesting uh, interesting project I have done in the past. Um, when you think about 
doing a shear, applying a shear load with friction. You may think friction may not be a cause of a problem as, um, as long as the friction is applied somewhere else, okay? However, in that system, um, what happened was there was a significant contribution coming from the fi friction. So that's what uh, I got from the um, Brussels as well as the experimental um, work. Um, so this is an academic license, so I cannot simulate it now. What I wanted to show you was the contacts, okay? So when I said about the assumptions, it's about the contacts and how you do uh, the analysis in a, um, a, a, a close as much as realistic, okay? So if you look at that, um, not that one, um, connection, so that's where the contacts. So you see the frictions between the bearings there, etc. So. These are the things you need to model. You need to um, you, you need to bear in mind about modeling a problem, right? So contacts. How um, realistically you can assume the contact. So if you think about any machine, the machine does have to contact with a, a adjacent component. Okay. So these contacts are important and that determines the linearity or non-linearity of a finite element problem. So then it comes to the meshing. So I will talk about that uh, in a bit. Um, the other thing is like, have you, um, what you think about um, the problem itself, whether it's a 2D problem you need to adopt or whether it's a 3D model you need to adopt, and what sort of governing equations you need to put, and what sort of parameters like contact mechanics, parameters from friction, parameters from, um, from, from the vibration, et cetera, to go into the solution. Okay, so these, these are the challenges in. So when I talked about the experimentation, so at the same time, uh, as an analyst, you have to create the um, experimental plan so whatever you assume, whatever you um, uh, you are thinking to do as a, a numerical problem, you have to do at the same time, you have to do the experimental um, experimentation as well. So this is the experimental test bed I have designed for that um, simulation. So then you have to do the experiment and compare it. So that's the idea. And that that's how we try to tackle a realistic engineering problem. So that's about it. I mean, there was a significant contribution from the friction plates into that um, loading onto the shear pin and the shear pin had to be redesigned because of that. And that was a, a surprising finding, okay? So that was the uh, output. Unfortunately, I forgot to put the result chart of the force and moment. It's the moment uh, reaction forces I got from that system actually. Uh, which explains um, the difference between the shear uh, load and friction load coming into that system. Okay, so the meshing uh, is all about um, um, what meshing you will adopt, what sort of strategy in terms of meshing you have to adopt in a mechanical design problem. Okay, so, so here you need to balance what sort of um, elements you have to choose. The more you choose in terms of the higher order, the more costly the uh, um, solution is, right? So that's why a um, two-dimensional analysis is always preferred wherever possible because that saves you time and um, that um, gives you the result fast as possible. And now there are issues in choosing these elements, for example, distortion, right? So, uh, and the, the higher order you select, again, it's a uh, problem. So just one thing to note there, that's an important um, element, LST, linear strain triangle. So it, it depends on the, the, the nodes are actually reading the displacement, right, with an approximation function. So I'm not going into detail about the theory. I'm just quickly going to another uh, solution to show you there. So this is an idealized version of a, um, 
simulation, which is actually converted into 2D. So this is bolt and nut in the face, right? So um, let me see if I can do some sort of analysis there. So this is how we idealize the situation. The realistic engineering problem needs to be broken down into very simple form, um, formulation. And that goes into the, um, into the um, numerical um, appro approximation, okay? So you can see the meshing there. I think it's already there. So you can see it's not uniform, right? The reason is because um, there are fine mesh going on with the interface because that's where we are focusing into getting the results out of this, okay? So very fine mesh there. However, there are areas which you are not interested to see the results much, okay? So there you can do a, a, a coerced mesh, right? So that's the idea of doing that. Um, then there are like um, things, force, um, boundary condition, the boundary condition here is the frictionless support, right? So I got a friction problem as well to show you. So this is how it is. So it's a linear static uh, analysis. So you can see the convergence. So maybe I can show you if I solve it to show you the... Um, yeah. Yeah, it's solving, it's trying to solve it. So what it does is, it's as I said uh, before, uh, regarding the Newton-Raphson technique, so Newton-Raphson method, it's trying to approximate the force and um, trying to converge that force, right? So, and then do the next step and do the iteration there. Um, Yeah, it's, it's doing. So you can see how it does get converged. So that's the criteria as part of the numerical uh, iteration. And then you, you have the force convergence coming in. Once the force is converged, it gets the stresses and all the other values. Uh, it gets the displacement and the other values of stress extra there. And then we have some criteria uh, put on to the, um, so it's still solving. So I'm just putting the other, showing the other results. Okay, so hoop stress is important. Axial stress is important. Radial stress is important. So in a bolt uh, nut interface. So the key thing there you can see is that is the um, interface between the bolt and nut. So what we have done there is we put the edge sizing there, try to, put the fine meshing over there. Um, and the connections and contacts is also important, right? Um, sorry, this is, uh, yeah, this is a non-linear thing so because there's a friction there. So that's why it took some time to converge, right? So that's how the non-linear thing works. So, um, so contact problems, very important, very important in machine design. So just a bit about the mesh quality methods, right? So there are structured meshes and the unstructured meshes. So very sophisticated software can give structured mesh, which is good because there are lots of quality things within the, uh, uh, within the finite element formulation, like uh, it depends on the quality of mesh, uh, you will get uh, um, realistic results, okay? so. One thing is called mapping technique. So uh, this is where you try to map exactly on both sides of the um, body or, or the surfaces you can see, that's called mapping. Biasing is where you, you, you have uh, to refine the meshes towards the edges of holes or any uh, objects like that, any features like that. So that's called biasing. So these are the uh, different kind of techniques. So I'm not going into detail about the quality uh, parameters there, like warping angle or Jacobian ratio. Um, these are all important while, while you try doing meshing, okay? Um, so 
the the important thing here is the fine balance between the accuracy voice the element size so you cannot i mean when you try to increase the element size the 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 numerical method is getting chunky and then you are trying you are actually you need to actually balance that expense of uh, using the computer to do that sort of big computation with respect to what sort of accuracy you need in terms of your result okay so sometimes it's just a sanity check so you can uh, with the expense of large sized elements you can get a less accurate result which may be sufficient in some cases so this shows the fine refined measures in terms of the element sizes there um, there's another thing called H element and P element meshing. Okay, um, so to put it simple, um, there there are different methods adopted for different types of analysis. Okay, so P meshing is uh, a bit more uh, light, whereas H mesh method is where uh, you do refinement um, and with a number of elements. Okay, so um, for each iteration, you don't need to um, basically you can look at that picture. So in the original mesh, it is like that. If you want to refine in the edge meshing, you are actually increasing the number of elements, okay? So that's increasing. So that means um, the element is same, type element type is same, same but um, more elements means more time needs to uh, get to converge, okay? Um, so here, what is like the number of nodes increase. However, the element size is not increased. So that's where you, so here it's less time required to convert. So you have large elements. So hence your result may not be that accurate. This is what design engineers while doing concept phases, while doing concept studies, we do P element meshing. Um, this is an example I have done on that uh, problem. So you can see brick elements there. The reason why we choose brick element is it reduces the number of degree of freedom within that finite element model. Okay, so that uh, in that way, you can save some computational cost in doing that. Um, in the, this meshing, you can see the contact pairs. Also, you need to mesh. So, um, um, as I said before, the types of non-linearity comes from geometrical material and contact, okay? So contact and materials are where the machine design part of things take. I mean, as a machine designer, these two areas are important. Um, beyond the elastic limit um, and within the elastic limit and the creep, these are the three material non-linearities. Um, just to remind you, the stiffness is a function of displacement in nonlinear cases, right? So, um, and also very large deformation. I don't know whether somebody heard of Piola Kirchhoff stress and true stress and true strain going into there where you, you have very large deformation. Okay, so that is the elastic region and that's the plastic region. So when we need to model that's what we need to do. So for material non-linearities, what the um, numerical method is, we, there is something called tangent stiffness. So that's the um, thing going to the stiffness matrix with the stiffness matrix uh, as a tangent stiffness. That's where you put a bit of plasticity in it uh, and that will approximate the plastic region in the system. So that's how we do the material, plastic material non-linear analysis. Um, contact problems, highly nonlinear. The reason is because of the friction and it, it's, uh, uh, it's, an, it's still in research process how to model properly the um, problems with friction. So one example is the um, rail uh, wheel interface design. Okay, so you can see uh, the, uh, um, the interaction there is complex and it's, it's a highly nonlinear that, uh, at that contact phase and uh, it's difficult to model that kind of things, okay? So that's, uh, that's important. The reason is convergence. It's, it's not easy to converge nonlinear contact mechanics problem. Um, 
So, uh, but if you think about the machinery, every machine component is working together uh, with other components and there is a surface of interaction. Uh, there is a surface, a contact surface uh, between them. So uh, the, you can see the static friction coefficient is mu s and uh, two condition there, sliding and sticking. So um, the ft is the tangential force so if it is greater than the, uh, the normal force Fn, then it's sliding. If it is less than the um, for normal force, it's sticking. So that's the principle. Okay, so modeling contact problems. Um, you can see the steps over there. So you start with the load increment there and it's, uh, so load increment is it gives a small uh, um, assumption of the um, load increased onto the uh, numerical method. And then it looks at the contact stage. So if the contact is open, then it won't apply in constraint. Um, sorry, that arrow should be the other, other way, I think. I uh, know. So it's this arrow is different. That arrow should be there like that. So it's, it looks at the contact stage, then it, it does an iteration based on that. Um, if it is closed, it applies constraint. Then it, it again checks the contact stage and it, if it is open, it goes back and do that. So actually my arrows are in, uh, in wrong direction and it comes back and it, 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 it try to close the contact, right? And try to find out the contact pressure if it is less than zero or greater than zero. And that at equilibrium, it, it, it looks at that contact pressure and then converge, but there are methods, right? So there are different methods to do. So first of all, um, the, um, the things when you try to model contact problems, it's like rigid to deformable or deformable to, um, or flexible to flexible. That's the assumption between the bodies. So there is a contact surface and target surface there, point to point contact, point to surface contact and surface to surface contact. These are the classification there. Now, when you formulate it, penalty method, Lagrange method, augmented Lagrange method. These are the main three categories of formulation. Multi-point constraints um, used in ANSYS. I have just written there, but I'm not going to explain it. Um, ex penalty method is the most popular one. So what it does is you got a penetration. So that's called master. So, and there is a slave there. So these are the contact surfaces. So what the numerical approximation does is it put a spring in between and it, it um, for each iteration, it tries to um, uh, find out the contact stiffness. So it tries to pull back, right? It tries to pull back uh, on the other direction, the, the contact force, right? So it's used in implicit and explicit analysis and it tries to find out the FKN. So it's, it's trying to find out the uh, contacts stiffness fact, factor, right? That's what it does. So, um, so penetration distance is important there. So that's the governing equation there. Um, and that converted into a newton raphson algorithm. Okay. It tries to look at the gap and it look, looks at the contact stiffness and for each iteration, it pulls back and it tries to bring, bring back and it again calculate the uh, the um, penetration there and see whether that penetration distance um, um, gives you the um, contact stiffness factor. So that was, it does. So there is a tolerance for that stiffness factor. And once that within that tolerance range, then that means it's get converged. That's the idea. Whereas the Lagrange multiplier method is a bit more simple where you got a penetration and you're trying to minimize that penetration, right? So what happens is the constraint, a particular constraints, when, when it is reaches zero, the, the penetration, it applies um, a constraint, right? So, so reduce the contact penetration, that's the objective. And um, the, it, because of that, it has a good accuracy there, right? So what it calculates is the traction force over there, P, 
right? And um, then it creates that matrix. And here you can see there is a zero diagonal matrix, uh, sorry, zero in the diagonal uh, um, direction of that matrix. So what happens is um, it's uh, the iterative solvers are not applicable there. So it's yeah. suitable for solving threaded connectors and plus fit joints, etc. Now, augmented Lagrange method is actually a combination of penalty and the Lagrange method. So you can get the both uh, benefits of both methods. Okay, so um, it has the penetration there as well as the um, the contact pressure. So that's the formula to get the traction out of that. So the numerical method is the newton raphson and you get the force convergence there. So I think I have shown you the um, simulation there about that. I think we are running out of time. So um, I have explained this in the last um, session. So you can see the, the problem with the contact is the, uh, is the conversion. So when there is no convergence, stress singularities appears and um, the, it can, the, the solution, uh, the problem can blow up. So that's where you need to do some assumptions in terms of uh, penetration as well as the, the method you adopt in doing the contact mechanics. Um, I don't know, I have time to simulate a nonlinear problem there. Um, Okay, I think I will carry on with the presentation and then try to finish it. And if you have time, we can do some simulation uh, on answers. Um, the other thing is the bolt pretensioning. So this is where um, another assumption in the numerical approximation you have to do. So there are bolt pretension elements. So this is where you, you have to put uh, bolt tightening inside the simulation. So I can show you that in there, I think that has been done over there. Um, you can see the bolt pretension there, which is tabulated over there. So for each time step, you can see you put a, a bit of amount of bolt pretension, um, which actually there is a bolt over there, geometry. Um, bolt. Yes. So that's the bolt, my bolt there. So what it does is basically um, it tightens towards um, getting into the actual tightening torque over there, uh, tightening load over there. So it's the pretension load going into that for tightening that bolt. But we need to do that step by step. And that's why the pretension elements are there. Um, so there are many methods you can follow to put that bolt tightening. So uh, most uh, popular one is the spider technique. So you put a beam element there and then connect with the nodes around that hole. Uh, hybrid is where you got two similar ones, um, the bolt head there, and that will actually, um, you apply the pretension on that. And solid is where, as you, you have seen in that model, where you put the pretension loads on that. Um, there. You can also do um, bolt pretensioning on that contact surface without bolts. That's also possible. Uh, this is the beam element I have told about, right? So this is the beam element over there. Bolt pretension is doing like that. So in order to get the accurate results, so bolt pretensioning is a must have in any design. So the next thing I have to show is the stress criteria. Okay, so this is elementary, but this is very, very important, right? So in a uniaxial um, stress strain curve, so you can get the stress and strain, value, but you, you have to remember the criteria you are, you are borrowing is a uniaxial test, okay? So that's helpful in determining the dimension as well as cross section of, a, of an object. However, in reality, most of the components you, you, you will come across are 
basically uh, based on multi-axial loading, okay? So that is not enough, right? So when you get a, a stress value, you cannot compare with that plot saying that metal, uh, that thing will be failed with that. It's, it's because it's uniaxial and you will experience multi-axial loading. So that's why we need theories of failure. Um, and um, so what we do is we do, we apply the theories of failure and compare with the uniaxial loading, right? So the, the reason why we need theories of failure is because of that reason. Um, objects experience multi-axial loading, right? Um, so you can see over there, this is very important. So um, as a beginner or as a person who is doing numerical analysis first time, there is a question, what sort of criteria they need to choose um, for uh, maximum, um, sorry, for, for finding out the result. Okay, for example, over there, you can see um, normal stress, equivalent stress, it's von Mises stress, I believe. So that's used. So in some cases, it's maximum principal stress um, is used, is used actually. Um, I don't know whether this one has it. Uh, maximum principal stress, you can see, yeah. So there's no result on that, yeah. So the reason is, is because for materials, cast iron or gearbox or blocks, um, it's basically the failure occurs due to the normal stress. So that's plane of failure. Whereas on maximum um, or for, for, the, um, uh, for the ductile material like mild steel or aluminum, um, things can fail in a 45 degree angle, very elementary thing. So that's the plane of failure, right? So we know that the, because there is no normal stress acting to fail that component. So that's basically coming from shear stress. So what causes shear stress? So von Mises stress is one of them. So it's basically, um, based on the shear stress principle. And there are, um, so it is shear strain coming into the one meters and the maximum shear stress theory as well. Um, you can apply that, uh, but von Mises is better which are, because it's coordinate, uh, correlate with experimental results. However, for rotating machineries like turbo machinery or turbines, um, it's uh, better practice to choose the maximum shear stress theory, okay? Now, um, load cases as well. So that's another thing. So the load cases will, would look like that. So you've got, um, that's an aircraft load case I have looked. So it, there is a cruise, that's where, sorry, uh, maximum takeoff. So that's where you can see the maximum load uh, acting on the systems flying, okay? And then the cruise condition where it um, uh, stays on that and then it comes down um, it's landing, okay? So that's how a flight, um, it's coming from the test results, okay? Test results, and then you take that um, number, so that plot into the numerical approximation um, for appropriate load. So load cases um, in a structural analysis, what we do normally um, is that one you can see over there. Or selecting on it. So you can see these one, two, three, four are given in terms of time stepping, okay? So different times. However, they represent um, different load condition. Um, right, I think it's, yeah, I think that's that's a linear one. But that's that's how we actually put load cases into a numerical method uh, in the software. Yeah, different time steps. Okay, so that's important. Now, other thing is international guidelines. So working um, the computational methods, when you, whatever you do, it needs to be uh, meet the international guidelines. For example, in Germany, um, we work with the um, FKM guidelines, okay? Um, the USA, there would be equivalent sort of guidelines, papers, and also standards. So ASME is one of them. 
Um, this is one of the standards I worked before for railway standards. So that's the structural requirements for wheel set. So there are different standards. These are just to give you a gist of information. So automotive or aerospace, EASA part 21, that's the airworthiness standard. Uh, you need to follow whenever you do uh, design or do structural analysis of um, the aerospace component. So that's very important because that gives the load condition or the things you need to do and things recur in order to comply with the certification requirements of the European um, Aviation Safety Agency. So similar to that, you got USA Federal Aviation Administration as well. So this is also important when computational mechanics comes into the mechanical design. So I got a few more slides. So it's basically talking about uh, bits about the axisymmetric problems, okay? So sometimes it's very expensive to do a complete set of um, full component going into the analysis. So that's where we need to break down that into a simple uh, estimation. So axisymmetric is one of them. So here what we do is like, because it's symmetrical, we can cut into half or quarter or eighth of the symmetry and then apply the loading condition and the boundary condition on that axis symmetric. So it's it's the plane stress and plane strain formulation basically. So, um, so no external constraints required for that, first of all. And if, if it is a 3D, it's, it's difficult to put constraints inside, et cetera. And especially if it is a pressure component like that, um, it's good that the axisymmetry can solve the similar problem. You only need to multiply, to, in order to get the, the final results, you need to multiply the number of slices it has. Um, so pressure loading is symmetric as well. So that's why uh, things like this boiler, so things like this we do uh, axis symmetrically. Um, one important thing is the constraints. So you can see the, the red one there, um, that surface is actually needs to be constrained with respect to the XY plane, that's that red plane. And the rotation needs to be um, freed up in this direction as well. So that's how it works. So it's, it's plane stress and plane strain. Um, the, the, the main advantage there is uh, meshing. So when you assume that in a 2D, then the meshing would be very easy. What it does, the software does, is it meshes on just a plane, um, assuming a plane stress or plane strain. And then, for example, the plane strain, it's the, the thickness uh, is assumed um, to be zero. And then it actually expands to that uh, thickness and gives the results like that. Um, so that's uh, a method we extensively use in machine design. Um, I think the, uh, the bolt um, and uh, the bolt thread analysis I have shown you, which shows you that sort of approach there. Um, so that's another thing. So the, um, I think that's contact mechanics and vibration is also important. So there are types of uh, analysis of most, uh, uh, most popular one is the model analysis where we do uh, try to find out the mode shapes, uh, critical mode shape and the natural frequency. The reason why we need natural frequency is to, uh, to tweak the design later to avoid resonance, right? Um, um, and the formula, uh, the, uh, the formulation is like that for model analysis, there is no damping and no transient elements. So it's M and K coming into that problem. Whereas force vibration is with all of them with damping and time variant loading and depends on the loading, uh, it can vary. So um, frequency responses or linear elastic kind of input goes, um, or sinusoidal excitation. So the loading would be sinusoidal. So uh, rotating machinery is an example. Transient response is where you got the constant acceleration, um, like the excitations on the road, etc. So mainly automotive um, designs work with that sort of um, philosophy um, for transient response. So that is not constant. Now, a random vibration is where earthquake modeling, for example, 
Um, so there is something called power spectral density. That's the input loading going into that. And you do the um, analysis. So that's called random vibration. Now you can see that's an example of a compressor blade with mode frequency. So the mode shape actually is very uh, useful for machine designers because that gives you uh, an idea how the system behaves in, in different sort of um, frequencies, okay? And that will take into account to avoid resonance as well as tweaking the design to avoid, um, to, to, um, to um, get the desired mode shapes, for example. So that's about the vibration and the fi fatigue analysis. You can see um, it's experimental data based as well as, um, the FEM based. So the finite element based is um, less expensive. And this is what we follow these days because the experimental, ex, um, in, 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 traditionally we used to have experimental data collected and that requires a lot of time. Loads of time you have to put the, um, the test, um, you, you have to put the test specimen for a long, prolonged time for um, the cyclic load with the cyclic load and that um, is ex expensive and extensive as well. So these days, um, the finite element based simulation taken care of that, uh, replace that sort of traditional techniques. Um, so no physical prototype record, right? So there are different approaches. So stress life approach is what we um, employ for high cycle fatigue, fatigue where um, elastic stress and strain. So it's basically based on the elastic um, stress analysis and then the uh, SN curve. Whereas strain life approach is where you got a low cycle fatigue and that's where you need um, the strain. So it's basically um, strain compared with the re reversal uh, EN curve, basically reversals, e I'm sorry. Um, yeah, strain-wise um, strain reversals data, Ian curve. So this is to predict the crack initiation life. Now crack propagation approach, there are methods like LEFM or EPFM, right? It actually estimates the, um, uh, so that's another approach for, um, that leads into the fracture mechanics. The other approach is the vibration, approach so you get a you do a dynamic analysis and you uh, check the resonance effect and um, sometimes you call it uh, frequency fr fatigue and you get a PSD power spectra density out of it and that goes into um, the fatigue analysis later with the finite term and code. Um, so again, another classification is static fatigue and dynamic fatigue where the input is static stress results and the other one is the dynamic stress results. So this is vibration based and that's static linear analysis based. Um, so different criteria there as well. Um, this is just to show a flow chart of how um, in industry, how we take care of the fatigue analysis. So all these inputs got a creep is a factor. Creep is the thermal induced stress actually. Uh, get into the system um, and the crack initiation approach is, um, so this is for turbo machinery. Um, so that's the flow chart. Um, so that at the end you get a, a you estimate the life, right? Of the um, specimen or the components. I think that is it. So. My point is the simulation driven product design is moving faster and that's the future. And uh, various types of analysis, unfortunately, because of the time constraint, I couldn't explain more uh, about the analysis type, et cetera. So automation in the design and manufacturing process. The, the other thing I haven't covered today is the manufacturing simulation. I, I talked about the, of the tolerance variation simulation. Okay, so that is in full sync these days because the geometric dimensioning and tolerancing is coming into picture these days uh, for manufacturing cost efficiency as well as the process simulation of uh, process, uh, process sequency or assembly sequencing. So all these are based on the simulation techniques like Monte Carlo for optimization. So 
just bear in mind finite element approximation also coming into that. For example, you go uh, a stress result that can read into the manufacturing or tolerance variation technique, and that will again give you a better understanding on the problem, etc. Um, time to market is crucial because that's what uh, manufacturing is aiming at. Um, and the other thing I haven't covered today is the experimental validation. So there are many techniques uh, using strain gauges, accelerometers, load test, uh, load um, cells, etc. So these things go in parallel with the um, stress analysis or the structural analysis. And it is the analysis job to actually define the experimental plan and select what sort of experiment they need to track the actual load, which needs to be compared with the uh, analysis results. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you very much. I hope I have covered uh, most important bits uh, of machine design, um, the computational techniques used in machine design today. I can now um, look into your chat box and see if any questions came up. Uh, participants, uh, please type your questions. Uh, Halim Shah, can yeah, I got, yeah, I can see the chat box. Um, so I, I feel um, I, I, can, I can start Dr. from there. Adam yeah. Solange. All right, okay. Have you shared the slide? Okay, okay. I, th I, I had a, a problem in, in the beginning about the sharing the slide. Sorry about that. Um, right. Um, yeah, the the meshing regarding the meshing, there are many techniques like mapping uh, and the um, combination of one D to two D mapping, etc. So um, there are block method as well um, for three D two D mapping as well. So uh, in this in today's session, I just uh, purposefully avoid talking much about that because of the time uh, constraints I had. Um, I think as you, you are a doctor, so you might be better knowing than me about that. Thank you. Um, rolling bearing analysis. Yeah, um, I, I thought of including that, the rolling contact fatigue with respect to the um, okay, rolling bearing analysis. Um, I, th I thought of including that uh, but um, unfortunately, I couldn't for today. Um, yeah, there are many things in machine design, so it's a big um, um, topic to cover, actually. Um, due to friction, heat will generate how they will measure temperature and deformation will take place. So this is where the coupled analysis occurred. So what happens is, um, what you ultimately want to know is the um, deformation due to temperature, isn't it? So you put a t a temperature as an input, and then you try to find out the um, temperature induced stresses in the system, right? Um, that's how um, uh, it works. Uh, more node and elements confines finer mesh or how is mesh independent study depends on. So yes, more mesh and node is required, but you need, as I said before, it needs to be balanced. Uh, sometimes you, you may not need, uh, that's why the H element and P uh, type element uh, methods are required. So P element is where you are uh, just increasing the uh, um, order, that means the node within an element, but not increasing the element. So both have trade-off and uh, it depends on what type of analysis and what output you need, uh, what sort of accuracy you need. That's how um, 
we play with the meshing. So it's not, it needs not to be costly because um, in industrial perspective, uh, we need to get faster results. So in a very um, less time, you need to come up with results. So in those cases, what happens is uh, you, have, you do some assumptions in, in, in the meshing process um, and you don't need finer mesh. I mean, finer mesh may be required for research purpose, right? Um, but what, uh, in terms of the engineering calculation, we just need an approximation um, which can um, favorably or reasonably um, compared with a hand calculation sanity check or with an experimental result. I hope I have answered that correctly. Okay, no more questions I can see. Harim Cha, yeah. Uh, was it your master thesis that uh, a case study yeah. presented here? Yes, that's right. Yes. Usually, yes, in idealization, usually we say that or we teach to ignore friction. So to simplify yeah. the problems, we ignore friction and do analysis. So to okay. do. Like an analysis resulted in a loss of two fifty million dollars, as you said. Yeah. So in academics, we may be able to make idealization, but in I think in real situations, before ignoring or neglecting any of these silly things, a detailed analysis might be required. Is it the case? Yes, uh, I agree with that. I mean, especially that's the challenge. I have put some challenges in my last session. I mean, that's the challenge in nonlinear problems, um, trying to figure out the contact mechanics. That's one of the big things uh, in the industrial world, like how well we approximate the real time scenario. So friction modeling is one of them. The other thing is the material nonlinearities and coupling the material nonlinearities with the uh, contact nonlinearities. That's a challenge um, we face in industry. Um, you can see um, it's, and also the friction can vary as well. So it's not like you just put a friction coefficient there. The friction can vary with a linear or nonlinear fashion as well. So that function is also needs to be modeled. So these are the challenges. Uh, in a real-time scenario. Also, it is a case where we can compare the masters in our country and masters thesis in abroad. So the difference in the level of research work we do. Okay. Anyway, Halim, you have done an excellent session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, I, I actually intended to cover uh, the fatigue, the fatigue, and also the uh, vibration, the, because there are many theory in that as well. Very, very interesting things happening in industry as well. But unfortunately, I just limited my presentation to 35 or 30, 40 slides to meet up with the timing. Sorry about that. And uh, maybe in the future Inshallah, session, we maybe, can yeah, have maybe. a future session. As, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think this will be very useful for the faculty who teach. Uh, Computer aided design and analysis of Kerala Technical University, okay. design and engineering, machine design, also all these uh, faculties who teach in other universities also. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Again for thank you. presenting such a nice session. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. PLA. Hmm. Mm -hmm.